I hid in the shadows. From the darkness, I heard his cry. For the first time, I wondered, was this all a lie? He promised a kingdom, a world with no end. From the garden, he was taken with none by his side. Not even one had followed. Brought to Caiaphas, he was sent to be tried. As the crowd slowly gathered through the middle of the night, his death was their wish as they shouted and mocked. Turned over to Pilate, he was beaten, whipped. The question was asked, art thou the king of the Jews? His only answer, thou sayest it. No defense, no great words, simple silence from the Lord of Lords. Crucify him, crucify him, the people cry. Then Pilate gives the command, let him be crucified. To Calvary, he walks bearing the weight of the cross. The soldiers nail his hands and feet as the growing crowd just scoffs. Their wish finally granted as he is lifted to the sky. Every breath was a struggle. Death was in his sight. It is finished, he shouts, using all his might. The hand of the Father did the light of the Son for the first time separated from His begotten Son. The ground began shaking, the rocks split apart, pierced by a sword. Water poured from His heart. He was my Savior. He was my King. Death seems to have won. The final sting, his body was taken down by those who loved him most. All the hope he had promised seemed forever gone. Still, they prepared his body with care, wrapped in clean cloths and placed in the tomb. For days, for days they would come, their sorrow to share. It was on the third day early in the morning mary had come still in mourning yet this time was different no soldiers no stone no savior the news we were waiting to hear was proclaimed by the angels sitting there he is not here he is risen because he lives, my future is secure. Because he lives, one day I will see him face to face.
In the darkest of times, there is hope. When all seems lost, there is faith. Just when evil seemed to prevail, there is the empty tomb. And because he lives, we can live too. No matter who you are, you can call out, cry out, because Jesus is alive. So will you rise to walk in newness of life? Will I Rise with Pastor Jim Scudder, Jr. And that is the question, isn't it? And that's the, the question that so many people have asked throughout the centuries. I think most people that have ever put their head on a pillow wonder about death, wonder about what happens after death. The famous uh, psychiatrist who invented psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, called it the painful riddle of death. The smartest humans still can't figure out what is beyond the grave. So we have to rely on something outside of us or someone outside of us. And here at Quentin Road, we still believe the Bible. And, and kind of that's, that's an odd statement. You say, well, you know, every church believes the Bible. Well, it's not, not really true, actually. Quite a few churches don't believe that this is what God has told us or that there have been errors that have entered into this book. And in order to answer the question, will I rise, because that is the question, will I rise? We must first ask the question, did Jesus rise? Why is that such an important question to answer? Because if he rose, then everything in this book is true. If he didn't rise, then everything in this book is a fraud and we're really wasting our time. I mean, the cinnamon rolls were great, but that's about it, right? We might as well live life to the fullest, not worry about anything else because we live, we die, we cease to exist. The Bible doesn't say that. Uh, certain religious people have suggested that, or perhaps were misquoted recently, that there isn't a hell. But my friends, Jesus speaks of a hell. And the Bible speaks of a hell. And I'm not here to, to scare you, but I'm here to just say that if there is a heaven and there is a hell, we better make sure we know where we're going before we die. So that's why we're here today to answer that question, will I rise? This is a three-part series. Today we're going to talk about the prediction of the resurrection. We have to answer the question, did Jesus rise? And if it was foretold hundreds of years before he was even born, then that's pretty amazing. And then we're going to talk about the proof of the resurrection the next Sunday, next week. The proof of the resurrection. How do we know for sure that Jesus did rise, and there are historical facts that we're going to look at, kind of like an attorney looking at a, uh, a person on trial, and we're going to look at those things, and then we're going to, the third Sunday, talk about the power of the resurrection. If it was predicted and proven as a historical fact, what does that mean to me? So that's what we're going to talk about in this series, Will I Rise? And here today on Easter, it's rare to have Easter on April 1st. We know it's April Fool's Day. They also call it Atheist National Day, right? Um, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And there's so many evidences that there's a God. But we believe there's a God. We believe that on Easter Sunday, Jesus arose. And, and I know uh, one of our Sunday school teachers was asking one of your kids, do you know what happened to Jesus on Easter? And the, the kid didn't say anything, was silent. So the teacher said, well, it begins with an R. And the kid said, recycled? One pastor was making sure that the kids were listening to his preaching, and uh, he asked one of the boys right after the service on Easter, he said, little Johnny, did you, did you learn anything today? Little Johnny said, oh yeah. Yeah, today I learned that, that Jesus, uh, he, he, he came in on a donkey, and they waved palm branches, and then, 
and then they arrested him a week, uh, four days later, and then he was beaten, and, and then he was nailed to a cross, and then he died, and then they put him into the tomb, and they put a big stone over the tomb. And the pastor said, that's right, good job. Anything else? He said, yeah. And then in three days, the, the stone was rolled away, and Jesus stepped out of the grave. And if he saw his shadow, there'd be six more weeks of winter. <laughs> Talk about deflating the pastor. It didn't happen here, I hope. <laughs> what is it that happened on Easter, and why is it so important? Why is it literally so pivotal within history? Here we are, thousands of years after the day which Jesus died, three days later rose again, and we are gathered here in a church on a Sunday. Just the very fact that we're sitting here on a Sunday, do you know Sunday wasn't the second day of a nice long weekend? Sunday was the first day of the week. If you go to Israel today, we were just there a few weeks ago, today they're all going back to work. Sunday's the first day of the week. We, we say, no, Monday's the first day of the week because this is kind of the culture we've grown up in in a kind of a Judeo-Christian uh, country, but the Christians worship on Sunday. Why is that so important? It totally changed the day of worship. Something major happened on a Sunday to do that. Just the very fact that we're sitting here on a Sunday I think is a, another proof of the resurrection. But let's talk about, was this really predicted in what we call the Old Testament? It's the Hebrew scriptures, and we're gonna go through some of the Hebrew scriptures. We're not gonna go real long today, don't say amen. <clears throat> but we're gonna look at the fact, did Jesus rise? If he did, then will I rise? And the first thing we're gonna look at today is the prediction of the resurrection. This is astounding. If you'll have an open mind today and really look at this, you will, I, I really believe you'll be convinced or you'll just have to close your eyes and say, I know what it says, but I still don't believe it. Well, that's your option. Christianity really comes down to faith. But I don't believe it's blind faith. I believe there is so much here that proves that this is true history and fulfilled prophecy is one of those things. So let's look at that. The Bible says if Jesus or the Messiah is God, we're gonna notice some things. One, and Isaiah tells us that he's gonna be born of a virgin. Well, we know the Gospels, the true history of the Gospels tells us that Jesus was born of a virgin. That's a pretty big deal. Number two, that he'd be born in Bethlehem. Some people say, well, Jesus just self-fulfilled some of the prophecies. How do you self-fulfill where you'll be born? And he was born in Bethlehem, and Micah tells us that. Uh, that he would be coming from Abraham. Okay, we find that in Genesis 12, of the tribe of Judah. You know, there were the 12 tribes. It's pretty amazing that they would zero in on which tribe he would come from, the tribe of Judah. In Jeremiah 23, it tells us that he'll be a descendant of David. David was of the tribe of Judah. The da uh, David was first a shepherd boy, and then the king, King David that he would be descendant of David. And we know David was born in Bethlehem and Mary and Joseph went back to Bethlehem, both Mary and Joseph descendants of David. They had royalty in their blood and so did Jesus. He would be a performer of miracles and Isaiah tells us that. And of course we know Jesus was a great miracle worker. As we toured Israel, uh, we had 126 people from this church and other places around the country. We go every two years, and every site that we went to, we went to a place where Jesus did this miracle. Jesus healed this man uh, from uh, uh, a paralysis. Jesus healed this person from blindness. Over here, Jesus broke these loaves and fishes and fed the multitudes. I mean, site after site after site, miracle after miracle after miracle, all predicted in the Old Testament. Then we have that he would enter on a donkey in Zechariah. Last Sunday we, we preached about that, the triumphal entry of Jesus and how that was foretold to the day in prophecy in Daniel chapter nine. Now we're going to look at other things that were relating to the last day of Jesus' life. And by the way, I've only selected a few. There are over 100 pinpoint prophecies regarding Jesus as the Messiah. 
how, what, is the, what are the odds that this would be fulfilled accidentally by somebody? It's astronomical. It's beyond our human brain to comprehend if this happened by random chance. So that leaves us to conclude that this was all predicted way ahead of time, so therefore he must be the Son of God. Psalm 41, verse 9, look at that with me. And we've provided you, by the way, in your bulletins, a, a handout of our verses. We do this every Sunday, and it kind of gives you, uh, here's what I don't want at Quentin Road. I don't want you to say, well, that's your opinion. I, I literally want to say, thus saith the Lord. This is the Bible. And I, I, I want you, see, some churches just say, just, just trust the, the priest, the pastor, the, the, the man of God, that they're telling you the truth. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to trust me. I mean, I do want you to trust me. But I don't want you to just take my word for it when it comes to the Bible. I want you to look at it for yourself. So we put it on the screens, we give it out to you. Hopefully you have a Bible, you can look at these up in your Bible. And here are just some of the prophecies that predicted hundreds of years beforehand Jesus' final day. Number one, that he would be betrayed by a friend. It says this in Psalm 41 verse nine, yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread and hath lifted up his heel against me. And we know in scripture that in the garden of Gethsemane, right there on the foothill to the, uh, the, the, the hill, Mount Moriah, where the temple stood, where the Mount of Olives was going up, right there, Judas, one of the 12, a pretty close confidant to Christ, definitely an important figure, betrays Jesus with a kiss. Incredible, betrayed by a friend. You might have been betrayed in your life. Surely you've been betrayed in your life. And it's terrible to be betrayed. It's terrible to have someone turn on you. But if it's a friend, it's just horrible. And this is what happened to Jesus exactly as predicted in the scriptures, hundreds of years before he came. It also tells us in Zechariah eleven twelve 12, that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. That's very significant. It gives us precision. 30 pieces of silver. My dad used to say it wasn't 29 pieces of gold. It was 30 pieces of silver. By the way, some of you have asked about my dad. He had a mild heart attack a couple weeks ago. And I don't believe there's such a thing as a mild heart attack, you know? Uh, but he's doing fine. He's gonna have some sort of a heart, either open heart or a procedure to replace the valve. Uh, but I appreciate your prayers. That means so much to me and to him and to my mom and to our family. Thank you for that. 30 pieces of silver is significant, more than just it was predicted way back in Zechariah's day, but that this was the exact price if you owned, if you had a servant and your servant was accidentally killed, the person that accidentally killed your servant would owe you 30 pieces of silver. Why is that significant? Because Jesus said he came as a servant. He came humbly. He came for one reason. He came to die on a cross for you. Now that's significant. 30 pieces of silver. Well, it just, you know, I don't really believe the Bible. You have to deal with this. You have to deal with this. Uh, one of you, uh, we were speaking at breakfast, and you said, you know, just a short time ago, I was an atheist. And then I started to think about certain things, and I started to believe that there are angels, and there are demons, and there is a God, and, and there's a heaven and a hell. And he started to, to research and study the Bible and, and listen to the words of Jesus, and that convinced him that Jesus is the Son of God, who died for him on a cross and who rose again. You, you go from atheist, if you're open-minded, I don't believe you can stay an atheist or an agnostic. If you're open-minded and if you really wanna listen, it's all right here. The Bible also in Isaiah 50 verse six tells us that Jesus was going to be spat upon and beaten. Let's look at that. I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. I, 
You know, even if someone spits on you accidentally, you're talking and you're, you're, or you're at a meal and, you know, a little piece of food comes, that probably happened today, right? You know, it's so embarrassing and the person that did it will pretend like they didn't know it happened and the person that happened to, I mean, we don't like that. But if someone spits on you intentionally, and if this was, the Bible says Jesus is the creator. He literally spoke and all this came into existence. By the way, that makes a lot more sense to me that we evolved from a monkey, we evolved from the rock. I think the, the Bible's version of how we got here makes so much more sense, okay? But can you imagine the creature spitting on the creator? Now that is terrible, but predicted. They said that, that he would be, uh, his beard would be ripped out, that he would be flogged. And as we were uh, watching our first song today and, and the, the drama of Jesus being beaten, it just... I, I, tears were in my eyes. Tears were in my eyes. Why? Because this is, this is how much he loved me. This is what he did for me. He was ridiculed. He was spat upon. He was beaten. He could have just had a thought and, and we would have been just zapped, gone. You know, scientists still don't know what holds everything together. We know how a lot of this works, but we don't know what keeps everything together. The Bible says Jesus keeps everything together. And as they were ridiculing him and spitting at him and mocking him and flogging him and ripping out his beard, he could have just in one thought annihilated them. But he didn't. All predicted hundreds of years before he came. And then in Isaiah 53, by the way, the whole chapter in this great, incredible uh, book and chapter of the Bible speaks of the Messiah. Surely, in verse four, he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You see how personal it is? Jesus didn't come and was murdered. Jesus came as a sacrifice for us. Okay? Look at all the times that it refers to us. Our griefs carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I didn't list this verse, but in chapter 12, it talks about Jesus being numbered among the transgressors. Do you know Jesus wasn't alone at Golgotha, at the hill of the skull? He was not alone. He was in the middle, and there was a thief, a someone that truly deserved to die on each side. By the way, there's a sermon right there. One of the thieves looked at him, and without being water baptized, without giving to charity, without reforming his life, Without being able to do any good works, he said, remember me. Simple faith. Remember me. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. All of this predicted hundreds of years before he came that he would die for sinners. He would die by crucifixion. Now that is astounding. Why? Because crucifixion wasn't even invented yet. The Romans are the ones that made crucifixion a public, humiliating, terrible way to die. They would make sure it was public. They put him on a cross so people could see him. Crucifixion was one of the worst forms of death because it was a slow, painful death. You had to, uh, crucifixion was, the, the death came from suffocation. So as you're hanging there, you can't breathe and you have to lift yourself up to breathe. And eventually your strength goes out of you and you literally die from suffocation. But the Bible actually says Jesus died from something different. He died literally from a broken heart. Now, could the Bible really have predicted crucifixion? Let's see what it says in Psalm 22. By the way, Psalm 22 is another full chapter. If you read the whole chapter, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's hundreds of years before he came in the beginning of 
of Psalm 22, but in verse 14 it says, I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. You remember, Jesus said, I thirst. Thou hast brought me up into the dust of the earth, for dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. This is incredible predicted hundreds of years before he came, even before crucifixion was a thing. Then the Bible says that no bones would be broken. Why is that significant? Because usually at the end of the crucifixion, they would come and break the legs of the bones so they couldn't push themselves up anymore and breathe, and it would just be a, a quick end to what was a long and painful death. They broke the legs of the thieves, they came to Jesus, and he was already dead. Just to make sure, they pierced his side, also predicted. Not one bone was broken. It says in Psalm 34, 20, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. This is amazing. It also says that his clothes would be gambled for in Psalm 22, 18. They part my garments among them. They cast lots for my vesture. You know, there's a place that we usually go to in Israel, in Jerusalem, in the old city, and there's a, an etching on the floor. It's, it's an old Roman stone, 2,000 years old, and there's a game etched into that stone, and you can go there, and they call it, today, they call it the game of the cross. They say they literally, the, the soldiers would gamble for the, the effects of the prisoners that would be crucified. And just as predicted, they part my garments among them. They cast lots for my vesture. So was Jesus' garments gambled for. Well, it's just all coincidence, right? Isaiah 53 verse 9 tells us that his grave would be with the wicked and the rich. In other words, he would be buried in the grave of a rich sinner. Well, we're all sinners, but this grave wasn't designed for Jesus. It was designed for someone else. It was designed for a rich man. It says in Isaiah 53, 9, he made his grave with the wicked and, and with the rich in his death. Do you know the Bible tells us that Jesus was hastily buried in the tomb that wasn't designed for him, but it was designed for Joseph of Arimathea, a high up official, a rich man within Judaism, a believer secretly that Jesus is the Messiah, and him and Nicodemus, we read about him in John 3, quickly came and took the lifeless body of Christ and put him into the tomb. And then we have some glorious news. Isaiah 53, verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. And that's terrible. The darkest day of all humanity was the day that Jesus died. Actually, the earth grew dark and shook. It was so bad. But then the prophecy starts to ramp back up from the, the most dismal point in humanity to the most triumphal point in humanity. He shall see his seed. Now wait a second. He was cut off from the land of the living. He was dead, predicted. But now it's predicting that he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. So how do you have a dead person whose days will be prolonged? The resurrection. The resurrection. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Psalm 16, verse 9. Therefore my heart is glad, my glory rejoiceth. No one's here mourning today. We're here rejoicing today. For he is risen. He is risen indeed. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. That's not the eternal lake of fire reference here. This word is a Hebrew sheol, which means the grave. In other words, this was predicted that Jesus' body would not remain in the grave. Neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. For in three days he rose again. And then Job really has the answer to our question, will I rise? Look at Job 19.25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Those are three wonderful words, and I hope you can say that. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the later day upon the earth, and thou after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. 
Job had hope in the resurrection. I have hope in the resurrection. I hope you have hope in the resurrection. We were just in Jerusalem, just outside the city walls, just outside the gate called the Damascus Gate. Remember, this road was a busy road. They would make it a very public spectacle where Jesus died. There was a hill called the Hill of the Skull. That's what the word Golgotha means, and actually, that's also what the word Calvary means. A place of the skull, a hill of the skull. That's just right here, just to the left of that. If you're standing with your back to the Damascus Gate, the hill of the skull here, he would have been crucified there at the bottom of that hill. Just over here, literally probably 200 feet, is a tomb. And I want to show you a video of that tomb. Right behind us is the garden tomb, and it's an empty tomb. Of all the religions and all the religious leaders and figures the world has ever known, you'll always find their bones. But in Christianity, there are no bones to find, for Jesus rose again. The tomb uh, of Jesus, very possibly the tomb that he laid in behind us, we don't know the exact spot, and sure. I think there's a good reason for that. I think if we had an exact spot, we would worship the spot. Yes, we're inclined to do that. But worshiping God is the, is the key, worshiping Jesus. We don't worship a place, we worship a person. Yes. But we do recognize there is an empty tomb. Oh, yes. And you have been able to go in and uh, look at some of the details of that tomb, explain the tomb. Uh, oh, the tomb, now while we're as sure as we can be archeologically that this is the tomb because uh, first of all, it's empty. Uh, there were changes made to the tomb at the last moment to accommodate a taller person. Jesus was reputed to be taller than the average Jew. Outside, there is a deep set uh, peg of iron uh, that you just can't get out of the rock of the face. It was driven deep, apparently, to hold the band that sealed the huge stone, the circular stone. In addition to that, when you look at the photos of the tomb, I was mystified decades ago when I saw photos of the tomb. There's an area that is blocked in. Well, actually, the early Christians cut the face of the rock so that they could assemble outside regularly and look inside and be reminded as the service was held that it was empty. And to me, that is absolutely awesome. Uh, these are marks. These are marks that indicate that we're at the right place. But God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we're not anchored to a place. We're anchored to the living God and the risen Christ. There's a fact of history, and that is Jesus arose. And the resurrection, I think, is that cornerstone of not only history, but also of proof of the gospel message and proof that God loved the world and proof that Jesus is the Son of God. It's all the tomb, it's all the empty tomb. The resurrection of Christ is so important. This is the place of the anchor and the launching ground for eternity. The resurrection is the constitution of the Christian faith. Isn't that a beautiful place? And it is empty. And because of that, because of the power of the resurrection, we can have the power of God in our life to avoid hell and to go to heaven. In Philippians 3.10, it tells us that we can know him and we can know the power of his resurrection. Do you know him? Do you know him? There was a young girl, 15 years old, vibrant, prime of life. Everything was going good. Her name was Katie. Suddenly, she came down with a disease, and that disease racked her body, brought her into paralysis and near blindness. The doctor was outside the door talking to the parents, Katie in the room, and the doctor said to the parents, I'm afraid Katie has seen the best of her life and it's only gonna get worse from here. And Katie said, I heard you, and you're wrong, because my best days are yet to come when I shall see the king in his beauty. 
Don't you wish sometimes we had that faith, the faith of children? Well, you can have that faith. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's true. And I, if you're going to argue with me on that, I really have nothing to argue with you on. It's just a fact. If we really are honest, we're all sinners. We've all stolen something. We've all lied. We've all done, done the Bible says, many things that are sinful, that are wrong against God. And that's bad, but that news gets worse. The wages of sin is death, according to Romans. We're all sinners, Romans 3.23 the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So that means all sinners will go to hell. The place designed for the devil and the demons. We all believe in, there should be a place like called hell for the really bad people and the devil, but we don't think we should go there. Well, my, my friend, we, we should go there. That's what we deserve. But the news, the bad news gets really good. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because he rose, and if you'll put your faith in him, not become religious, not join a Baptist church, Baptists can't save you. The only thing that can save you is faith in Jesus Christ. It says it right here, we love it so much, we put it on the wall, right in the, the Bible, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, but most people don't know it, for God so loved the world, that's all of us, that he gave his only begotten son, that is Jesus that whosoever, that's all of us, believeth in him. Believing is to trust. It's faith in him. Jesus should not perish, which is hell, but have everlasting life, which is heaven. You say, well, show me another verse. Okay, we've got a couple more up here. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. You know, that's the same Greek word as believe. One's a verb, one's a noun. Same word, pistuio and pistis. And that not of yourselves. It's not by what we do. It's not by us being religious. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. That was in Romans 6.23. Gift. What is a gift? A gift is something you give. It has to be free. Nothing attached. You can't work for it. You can't pay for it. You can't take it back. That's a gift. The Bible, God himself, is calling salvation a gift. Not of works. That, that is what really separates the Bible from all religions. Even some who are called Christians believe that I can work for it. I can do something. I can earn it. Not according to the Bible. It's not of works. It's a gift. None of us will be standing in heaven saying, I deserve to be here, boasting about it. No, we're all going to say, I don't deserve to be here, but I put my faith in Jesus. He died on a cross for my sins, my iniquities, my transgressions. I believe in him and him alone. And if you do that, the Bible says you will pass from death to life. You will literally be born again and never perish, but have everlasting life. That is not my opinion. That is right here in the Bible. And I hope that you know that as Katie knew that, as I know that. And we'll give you that opportunity right now. The Bible says that we're sinners. Watch this carefully. You and me have sinned. This is sin. This is all of us. We've fallen short of the glory of God. This is the Lord. He was perfect. Our sin separates us from him. He loves us so much that he became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Did you just see the visual? We had sin. He paid for that sin on the cross. And if you'll trust in him, you'll have everlasting life. That's the answer to Freud's painful riddle of death. That's the answer to the question, will I rise? Believe in him and you shall have everlasting life. Would you please bow as we are concluding this part of the service in prayer with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. We want this to be a private moment between you and God. Have you ever remembered a time in your life when you've realized as a sinner you need a savior have you ever taken the time to put your trust and faith in not yourself, not your priest, not your pastor, but in the person and work of Jesus? Have you ever done that? If you haven't, do it right now. Do it today. Because the Bible says today can be the day of your salvation. Say something like this in silent prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. But right now, I believe that Jesus died for me on a cross and rose again the third day. I trust in him. 
And if you'll do that, it's not your prayer that saves you. It's your faith that saves you. And you say, I don't have enough faith. It's not about how much faith. It's about who your faith is in. If you have a little bit of faith in Jesus, that's enough faith to save you for all eternity. I'd like to pray for you if you've made that decision today. Would you raise your hand today if you've just put your faith in Jesus Christ? Just raise it up for a moment. I won't embarrass anyone, but I'd love to pray for you. You're saying by raising your hand, Pastor Scudder, today I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Can I pray for you? Would you raise your hand today? I see several. God bless all of you. Today, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know all the Bible, but I know one thing. Jesus rose again, and I believe in him, and I trust in him. I see many hands. Any others today? Raising your hands, not what saves you. It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I am so thankful for all of you today that have made that decision. Lord, how grateful we are for salvation. How grateful we are for eternal life. We're thankful for the fact that you did rise again. And we're glad that we can be here today to celebrate that. I'm grateful, Lord, for all in this room that have made that decision today. Lord, help them to know they are born again and they can never become unborn. And Lord, help them to serve you and learn more about you and grow and and allow the Spirit of God to help them in their life to be everything you want them to be. We thank you, dear Father, for the wonderful folks that are in this room. And we ask that they have a blessed Easter Sunday. In Jesus' precious and holy name, we pray these things. Amen and amen. God bless you. The best is yet to come, by the way, the kids, right? The kids. Amen. Before the kids come, we are going to take an offering. We're a Baptist church, so you can't get around that. And by the way, here's how it works. So, so you're wondering, well, how much do I put in the plate, okay? It's very simple. If you ate breakfast, it's proportionate to how many cinnamon rolls you had. Okay, so some of you men, get that checkbook out. It's gonna be a big check. All right, you know who you are. And, uh, but no, we're just grateful to have you here today. And uh, if you're a guest, you're new with us here today, listen, maybe today is the first time that you understood what Jesus Christ can mean to you personally. Maybe today is kind of the starting point for you and really understanding that God is a personal God. In your bulletin, there's a card, looks like this has got cookies on it. Actually, if you fill that out, we're gonna send you some really gooey, warm, they actually come in the box. When you open it, they're still hot, okay? Just try it, you'll see. Okay, now you gotta leave it over the heater, the the vent, for a little while before you open it, but it works. But here's the thing, you can connect with us on this, give us your email or your address or your phone number you want. We're not gonna bother you unless you want us to talk to you, but listen, God is a very personal God, and he wants to have a personal relationship with you. It's not just another religious experience, it's not just another denomination. God and his word is very personal. And if we can help you with that, we would love to be able to do that. So connect with us, uh, with us on this if you can and want to today uh, through that card. And uh, as the kids come, again, we're thankful for you being here today. We hope that you have enjoyed your time. And more importantly than anything, we want you to know that God loves you so much and that he sent his son to die for you. And I hope that you've realized that today as we give to him, even worshiping him through our giving this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you for the service that we've had. Thank you for sending your son so that we can go through life, Lord, with many trials and troubles, yes. Heartaches, yes. But with the hope of eternal life because of your dear son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As the kids come, we're going to sing Jesus, Messiah. Speaking of our Savior, if you know this song, join us as we sing. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the
Thank you. 